Hey, this is Chris from the Criminal Perspective Podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast you're currently listening to on the Crawl Space Media Network, consider checking out Criminal Perspective. On Criminal Perspective, I take 11 years of my experience corresponding with notorious murderers and I bring it directly to you. At times, I'll give you interviews directly with the most heinous murderers imaginable, like Nico Klo, the Vampire of Paris. I read that I read that you found some cookies in his kitchen and you just sat there eating cookies, watching them squirm around and die. Yeah, it wasn't actual cookies. I think I, I think it was bread, just bread. But uh, yeah, yeah, I ate something. I just sat sat down on the corner and watched him die, basically. Other times, I'll bring you survivors of violent crime telling their harrowing tales themselves, like Shasta McLean, who survived being abducted by serial killer Joseph Duncan. After being at that campsite for like two, like a week or two, he had asked me how I wanted to die. He said because uh, I had to choose one or the other. It could either be quick or it could, or, you know, it could be the slow process. So he gave me the option of being strangled to death, where he gave me the option of being shot. So please check out Criminal Perspective on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are heard. Criminal Perspective is a cross-space media podcast. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. And we're joined today by Lewis Berry and Greg Overacker from Private Investigations for the Missing to talk about the Brianna Maitland case. Once again, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Boston Green Health and Othram Labs, for their support. And if you'd like to support our podcast, please contact us and let us know. We'd also like to thank all of you for your very kind comments about Mind Over Murder. One in particular stood out for us this week. A listener named Andrew tweeted this morning, I've heard many different podcasts tackle Brianna Maitland's case. This is by far one of the most succinct, informative, and hopeful takes on this case. I believe Othram will do their best, hopefully finding a lead for law enforcement to hunt down and finally finish this. Well, we know there's been a lot of great coverage on the Brianna Maitland case, and we hope to rise to the level of some of the other coverage we've heard. Thank you so much. That really made our day here as we were recording a new episode. Thanks to all of you for your ongoing support. And for more coverage on the Brianna Maitland case, stay tuned here on Mind Over Murder. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Today we are joined by not one, but two special guests, Lou Barry and Greg Overacker. Thank you both for being here. We really appreciate this. It's a pleasure. And, you know, thanks for providing the coverage to the case, because that's a case like this, that's what's going to solve it, is information. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. Well, thanks. Our friends at Crawl Space have done an extensive amount of work on this case, <laughs> and I had called up Tim and Lance, and I said, hey, are we stepping on your toes if, if we talk to Lou and Greg and do some coverage on the case? And they were like, no, great, this is fantastic, because I think they feel the same way, which is that more people we have talking about this case in Vermont and across the country, the more chances we have for finding out what happened to Brianna Maitland, which is the topic of this discussion. So well, we're being loaned out. Yeah, on some level. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another word for that, but I, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually thought you were going there for a second. <laughs> you know, you know, Bill. The thing is with Lance and Tim, not only are they they're good at what they do with the crawl space and getting the information on everything else, but they're also members of the board of directors of Bruce Maitland's nonprofit. You know, this type of publicity is good not only for her case, but for other cases out there where people who can't afford higher private investigators can take advantage of 
private investigations for the missing and, and utilize their services. And we've made some wonderful friends with some very nice people. Yeah. They're, they're both very nice people, nice families. Yeah. Oh, that they are. We're, and we're very proud to be part of the crawl space media. We like to call it a juggernaut for some reason. Yes. <laughs> we're very proud to be associated with crawl space. Let's go ahead and start by you guys telling us a little bit about yourselves. So Lou, we know you were a police chief for many years. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I I started off down on the Cape uh, as a police officer for about 11 years. I was a patrolman for a short time and then a detective for six years and then sergeant and then relocated back to the western part of the state and became police chief. I stayed there for 24 years um, and then retired. I've been teaching as an adjunct at colleges since 1990. I still do that at, at a couple of different locations. I do a lot of training at the police academy. I filled in twice as an interim chief at a college, local colleges. And, you know, I try and do this as best I can on on the side. This is kind of like my passion, I guess. Investigations always was, even when I was a detective. And of course, when you're chief, you don't do that anymore. You know, you you might oversee things, but you don't uh, investigate. But I, I got into private investigating actually through a friend who was filing a civil suit after after getting the statute of limitations on civil suits changed relative to sexual assaults on children. And she had been abused as a child and um, wanted to file a civil suit. So I became a private investigator basically to help her out and do an investigation. And fortunately, she got a nice settlement in federal court. And I did a couple other cases after that. And then, like, there was a lull. So I was familiar with Brianna's case. And just because I went to college in Vermont, and I'd seen it, and it was interesting. And so anyways, that's I kind of fell into that, missed the cold case aspect of it. And now that's pretty much our focus, my focus. Wow, that is that is really excellent. Greg, is it true that you really started off as a bounty hunter? I did. I did things backwards. Did Doesn't it look like dog? I did, I did, you know what? <laughs> we used to go to Las Vegas to uh, – Professional bail agents of the United States would have a convention. There, oh, I'll whatever. bet. I'll bet that one's a, <laughs> a, a, a hoot. Yeah. Well, we take classes and stuff. So the 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 bondsman that I'd go with, you know, they had different things. And of course, you'd have dinners and auctions and stuff like that. I'd take classes and stuff. But he insists that he sat at our dinner at one point before he was known. I don't remember him being there. But there was a table of like twenty people. But later on, he went on to. Uh, you know, give speeches there and stuff like that. It was just kind of interesting. You know, nice little backstory. But yeah, I started out backwards. I started out doing that. I went to school to criminal justice, but I was just absolutely bored with my life. I wanted adventure. I was in a, in a really obscure business. It's, it's obscure where I live. You know, you go to certain states like New Jersey at the time, you could walk for blocks and blocks and blocks, and, and there was bail bondsman offices, one right after the other. <laughs> that does say something about New Jersey, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> California was like that. Colorado was like that, which is where, you know, you mentioned dog. That's where he was for a long time, was in Colorado. I, I was kind of shocked, actually, that he could function because he was a felon. He, and I think he that's maybe why he went to Hawaii. But anyway, uh, I would travel to New Jersey because I worked for a PI in New Jersey. I still do. But New York didn't have a lot of bondsmen. It wasn't a big thing here. So I would advertise nationwide and I would get like a one to 4% return. Like I would blanket states with advertisements and I would get returns. So I traveled a lot. What they would do is they would call some, call me in New York to try to bring someone back from the Northeast to say down to Florida or wherever they were at the Carolinas. So I would pick them up, take them down there, get paid and come home rather than those people driving all the way up here to look for somebody. You know what I mean? That's kind of how that, that business functions. But I did that for a long time and it was all I thought it would be as far as, you know, being exciting and everything like that. But at some point you just get tired of traveling and being in hotel rooms and not being home. And, you know, I had, people here. I, I wanted to come home and be with my family. I wanted to take care of my property and stuff. So eventually I kind of, I started a process serving business. I had repossessions on the side and I did PI work. But oddly, when it came to this, this looking for missing people, I was on the throughway with my daughter on Father's Day and I saw Brianna's poster. I had taken her to the restroom and I, I was on her like a hawk, of course, it, being in a public place like that with a little kid, especially a little girl. And I'm waiting at the bathroom door and the poster was there. And when she came out, I told her to commit it to memory and she did. And she was young. And I got home and I did a bunch of research on it and contacted the family and kind of went from there. 
this is what I hope to transition into and just do this alone. You know, and Bruce and I had had this conversation for years about the, the nonprofit. I, I, it's just between working and doing everything else, I didn't have time to go do this. I talked to a few attorneys about it and stuff. But when Brianna's uh, reward money had come timed out, they, they have to put it into a certain account. And eventually the money doesn't get used. It times out. They'd have to do it all over again. He took the money out and, and, and applied it to starting a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So this is the origin of private investigations for the missing. Yeah, you know, I was when I went up and met with them in Governor, New York, where they were living at the time, and and to, it seemed really odd. And they would hear a lot of people say this afterwards. It seemed odd to me that they would move away from where Brianna went missing because you're thinking to yourself, well, they got to stay there. You know, they have to find her and this and that. Well, they had to get some sort of normalcy. They just had to, they, it, and it wasn't that far away. But every day, I mean, it was just constant. I can remember Kelly telling me, her mother, that she would go first thing in the morning to McDonald's to get a cup of coffee, and they'd give her a forlorn look and hand her coffee out to her and say, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Because that's how I started my day, you know. So quickly, you know, I was running back and forth to Vermont a lot at the time and staying up there for a few days at a time and stuff and getting court paperwork and whatever. But it's expensive. And we got talking about it. There's no way anybody can afford this. How could anyone possibly afford to pay an investigator? They, they charge anywhere from 100 to $200 an hour, sometimes more, plus expenses, gas, right. food, lodging. Right. You'd have to be wealthy to afford that for, for months or maybe even years. So it was it was a great idea. I think it's, it's the only one I've ever heard of, the only, the only one in existence uh, operating like that. So, yeah, so this is where I ended up. I still work here at home. I do other things, but I'm going to, I'm slowly transitioning into being that there full time. And hopefully Lou will too, because we don't want to lose him. <laughs> just a couple observations about what he just said. Now, one, you know, I, I met Greg. We actually met him because he was, um, can you shut that door for me? He was um, obviously a well involved in a case before I got involved in it and, and wanted to work along with him and everything. And then he, he told me a story one night and he was chasing this guy and he wound up out in the freaking woods and, the middle of nowhere in Vermont, and the guy was in a cabin, and there was gunshots fired. You remember that, Greg? And, and he, wanted <laughs> walk in, he walking the guy out of the woods. It was like I said, I got to work with this guy. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> so that was up, yeah, up on the Canadian that border. Was, that's yeah. freaking dedication, you know. Yeah. Um, you no, know, back then, people like, hey, you know, it's four o'clock. We're out of here. You know, <laughs> it's time to go for the day. So, I think about and, that now, and it seems crazy, but at the time, it was crazy. It, yeah, at the time, it just seemed like, well, this is what I'm supposed to do, so I just do it, you know. And the other observation, if you made note of his story, he brought his daughter into the, the place, and he saw the poster. And he said to her, "Remember that, memorize that," because he didn't want to. So he made her memorize it, and when he got home, he took notes off of what she told him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's because she, she had it a worked. she had a sharp yeah. she had a sharp uncluttered mind. And you use the resources that you have. That's, That's right. <laughs> it kind of broke my heart. I'm sitting there thinking it's Father's Day. And here's this girl has a father who doesn't know where she is today. Yeah. That broke my heart. Yeah. And, you know, that that goes back to that whole thing where I get frustrated with the police it, it, because we don't know what they're doing a lot of times. So they could be very active and we don't know it. You just automatically assume they're not. But for every day they don't work or they're not aggressive or they have other things to do, Someone is in horrible anguish, mm-hmm. and it just goes on and on and on and on. There's another case we're working right now where you know it's 34 years in, and then you talk to, to you know talk to the investigators and, and other investigators, PIs and stuff that have kind of thrown in the two cents or worked it, and they say, well, you know, maybe next month. Well, next month, it's been 34 years. Shit or get off the pot. Do something. You know, stop making a date for next month. So that's a frustration I have. How long have you been involved in the case, Greg? You know, just for our listeners, uh, Brianna disappeared in March 2004. Yeah, that would have been Father's Day 2006 when I saw her poster, and I got right on it after that. I called the family and drove up. When I got to the Maitland's house initially in Governor, I remember finding the address, and uh, it was a farmhouse, and there was a long driveway and barbed wire fence. They had horses and stuff. They had um, alarms on their driveway. They had two dogs that acted like they were going to kill me. <laughs> I, I don't know if they would have, but I think there was a certain amount of just tension. And they had threats that came their way and stuff like that. And I that always really bothered me. I thought, who the hell threatens someone whose child's missing? What the hell's the matter with you? What kind of mental defect do you have? But 
that happened and it happened kind of regularly, which is the whole reason they had alarms and everything, you know, well, as we've discussed, Greg, it, it's common thread to these cases is the two suspects. If there are no suspects are a family or the police. <laughs> and that's yeah. over and over and over again. The first, the first people they look at is the family. And one of the reasons they moved from Vermont is, is Bruce was, you know, said that, people would you know give him that look like he knows what they're thinking you know were you involved you know yeah that's awful yeah it is it's terrible i mean you you're victimized twice and and then their fallback position is well it must have been the police and it's a cover-up yeah the (laughs) the police went really went over bruce hard they really went at him hard and yeah so that's the default position too that's really frustrating that when you talk to people that think that the police involved which Lou and I have talked about this a lot. It's like a default position. So I don't understand what happened. So I re- go back to the police. And then you ask people, well, what makes you believe that the police were involved? Well, they were there. Well, yeah, they were there. Someone called the police. They, they showed up. So they were there. But kind of like, like, like Maura Murray's case and stuff like that. But they really don't have the most people that believe that there's nothing to back it up, at least not very strongly. So that never came up. Well, yeah, that wasn't really an issue with, with this, but. I do find the threatening of the family to be really disturbing. I mean, it's like pain oh, begot man. pain, you know, uh, misery begot misery. Yeah. That's well, tough. Lou, do you remember when Waylon was living? This was, I think, before you came in, but Waylon was living down in the southern part of Vermont. I can't remember where exactly. And a newspaper article came out written by, I think, by Hank Alberelli. And at the time, Waylon was living with, I think he was engaged, but she went out to the post office or to the mailbox and there was a letter in there that said, I'm going to, I'm going to kill your girlfriend. Like I killed your sister. Oh my God. He was still in Vermont then. I mean, Northern Vermont. He was living in his house out in front. I think that was many years after. Oh, okay. My, my mistake on that. Yeah. But (laughs) they never found out who did it. You know, the, the article came out and named names. And of course that, so that threw a bunch of stuff in there. Right. the, the impact on the families is just, you see it over and over again with this. The, the families are torn apart, and a lot of times it, there's divorces, and then there's, you know, the family gets split up. It, they're barely talking to each other. I mean, it's just, it's it's over and over. It's this common thread. It's the same thing. They just keep getting victimized inadvertently, obviously, but it just doesn't stop. It's not, you know, they're gone. That's it. It just goes on and on and on until there's some type of closure, I think. I had said to Greg earlier today um, <coughs> that, using my own experience in the Colonial Parkway murders, we're not necessarily seeking a prosecution at this point. I mean, it's 30 to 34 years for us. I'm not saying I'm speaking for all eight families precisely, although I've had contact with all eight families and we do speak pretty frequently, but we're really looking for answers at this point. Now, if we ever were ever given a perpetrator or a potential perpetrator to focus on, my attitude might shift. But right now, when I wake up in the morning, I'm mostly looking for answers more so than I am a prosecution. I even said to our FBI agent recently on, regarding another case, you know, I said uh, they convicted a guy and they suspect that this guy may have been involved in numerous other Uh, rapes and murders in Virginia. And one of the things I said to the agent who had worked the case in a support role for local law enforcement, I said, you know, if there were ever a place where you got to that you were fairly certain that someone, this particular criminal, had been involved in these other cases, it would mean a lot to those families if you were to reach out to them and say, look, we believe that Mr. So-and-so was also involved in your sister, mother, what have you, rape or rape murder. But he's in jail. He's going to be in jail for the rest of his life. And we don't have enough to convict him in you, in your family's example. But I think it would make a great deal of difference to those families to know that the person that did this to their family has been caught and tried and convicted in another case. So... In a lot of ways, it's it's more about answers than it is necessarily about a prosecution. I'm not saying that Bruce Maitland and his ex-wife Kelly might feel that way. They might be completely focused in another direction. But I think everybody's mileage may vary a little bit in these cases that drag on for 
in this case, 16 years in the Maitland example. Yeah, you're right. And I, I agree. I think in this case, I think everyone would be, I don't want to say satisfied, but at least somewhat relieved to know what happened to her and not necessarily see someone punished for it. Although obviously that's ideal, but you know, right now with <laughs> Without proof, law enforcement's not going to say that because, you know, say, for instance, suspect X, they feel it's pretty strongly did it and don't have enough to charge him. And he's walking the street and a relative decides to take matters into their own hands. You know, now you have another situation on your hands and that person may have not have done it. You know, yeah. it's, is there, it's, it's a very tight rope, I guess, that they have to walk a lot of times. And that's why they don't clear people. You know, you don't want to clear someone because they may have an airtight alibi as to where they were, yet might have been involved in a conspiracy to do the crime. So you, they never come out and say, okay, so-and-so is cleared, even though they feel he's not involved. Mm-hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I've been following the case as Kristen and I have been sort of plugging into the, <laughs> the Brianna Maitland disappearance more. And I noticed the other day on social media, a guy was arguing that a particular suspect, and we can leave names out of this, he's saying he was definitely cleared. And my experience is there is no such thing. Can you two respond? Is anyone cleared before a case is cleared? No, and for exactly that reason. They will not say this person is cleared. They may say, you know, we feel he's not involved, um, but you're not going to come out and say they're cleared because unless you've solved it, Again, you don't know. I mean, if you could clear someone and then turn around, as I said, and say, okay, yeah, they didn't murder this person. However, they hired the person that did. So so you you can't clear someone. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. In these stressful times, everyone needs some time to chill out and relax. That's why we're excited to announce this week's sponsor, Boston Green Health. Boston Green Health is a local provider of CBD products that specializes in oils, topicals, gummies, and edibles. Boston Green Health's plant-based products can provide natural relief and rest for the mind, body, and soul. As one of New England's premier hemp-based companies, they offer a variety of all-natural CBD products that use a blend of locally sourced hemp extract. Visit bostongreenhealth.com for premium CBD oil, a delicious variety of CBD-infused gummies, luxurious handcrafted topicals, and a product line for pets. Mind Over Murder listeners can receive 20% off any purchase by using show code MOM20. Boston Green Health takes pride in being New England's most trusted CBD brand. Visit bostongreenhealth.com and use show code MOM20 for 20% off any purchase. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and DNAsolves.com. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. 
We're back here at Mind Over Murder. As far as I know, and I, I can almost guarantee it, 99%, there is no video of that person coming back from Canada on a, through customs. Yeah, I actually thought that one was a real... I, I don't know where that came from, but Greg, have you ever heard that? No, what, what, what's, who, who are you talking about on camera? Robitelli. Oh, no, no, he was... Online no. said that it was a video of him coming through customs and... In, in, who said that? Somebody online. It was just one of Oh, oh no, was there was nothing like that because he never did. No. He, he, he wasn't in Canada. He wasn't in Canada, right? Yeah, yeah so this, that can't, it can't exist. You know, we thought we thought that for the longest time. That's another thing, you know, as time goes on, your opinions sway, everything ebbs and sways, and, and you get more information, so you change your mind, or you, or you realize you had bad information. And that was a situation where we had bad information, and I had bad information from extremely good sources where they said, look, you know, you don't need to pursue A, B, and C anymore because of A, B, and C. Well, that just wasn't the case. You know, he changed his story. How many times did he change his story? Uh, every time they, every time somebody talked to him, he changed his story. <laughs> and then, and then, fi- the final story that he gave to Lou was probably the correct one. Was most likely the right one. They had him. They they grilled him till he was literally crying. I mean, they really hammered him good, from what I understood. What was the time frame he gave you? Two thirty a.m. He was coming from. Uh, That's what he said originally. It, no, I take it back. Originally, he said he came by about four thirty. Right. And but he eventually said it was two thirty. Right. And he hadn't been to Canada. He'd been doing some illicit activity with with another individual. With another individual who was who mentioned over and over and over again, and even had part of his property searched. And then he said he what saw the saw the vehicle, knew it was hers. Uh, with the lights on, yeah. yeah, and he approached it, and both doors were open, passenger and driver. He shut both doors. Now, my line of thinking, part, he shut off the lights. Part of my thinking on that was that he wants to place himself there. He wants to tell you he was there because he's afraid they'll find his fingerprints because he touched the vehicle. Although this guy, James Robitelli, and it's spelled Robitai with a French pronunciation, right. is Brianna's on again, off again, boyfriend. So, Greg, as you've pointed out before, his fingerprints could have been on Brianna's Peter Oldsmobile from you know any number of times riding in that car. Yeah, I mean, they were friends. You know, that, that, it's a weird thing when you talk about these kids dating and stuff like that. The dating pool is thin. <laughs> these it's are small, really small to, towns. I went to a small high school, and I think my graduating class was 120 people. You kind of dated through the class. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was just common. These guys, it was really bad. It was just, but they were all friends too. And, and whether they dated, you know, different people in this and that, they were all friends. But yeah, he could have been. But that was just my thinking: was that does he want to? Does he want to tell the police that he was there because he knew his fingerprints were going to be on that car, or did he honestly do something stupid by walking up, shutting the doors, turning the lights off, and then just go, dr- driving home? And then you ask him why he he didn't call the police. Her car's there abandoned and stuff. And he said, "Well, I'd been." drinking and stuff and i didn't want to i was going to call the police and get them there to arrest me you know so you kind of okay kind of understand that and it's all very hanky you know but But, robotelli but lou as you were saying as robotelli's story keeps changing though i was in canada which is not far away from northern vermont I went by there at 4.30. I went by there at 2.30 a.m. Now, I know he's drunk and high and who knows what else. When this incident goes down where Brianna's car comes up abandoned, but what do you make of the changing stories? Well, I I think you can factor in a a few things. First, the activity he was involved in, he's not going to come out and say to the police, hey, this is what I was doing. So he's got to make up something. And we're not talking someone who's... As we said, you know, Greg mentioned the type of crime he was involved in before. That's the type of mentality we have here. We're not talking about a master criminal. Maybe it was the best he could come up with at the time. And now, you know, years later, you're talking about a a memory that's 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. Right. um, In a haze to start with because of substance abuse. You know, and it, we run into that a lot talking to people. It's like, what about this? Jeez, I, you know, I really don't remember. Yeah. You know, I, it was yeah. a long time ago, and I was messed up at the time. And, uh, you know, you hear things, and their memory gets jaded. And, you know, I think that uh, that would excuse a lot of it. Why he didn't tell the truth a lot, I, some people would just like that. I mean, I, I've dealt with yeah. people like that before that just, in his no defense, reason. 
you know, in, in his defense and to the people that love him that are going to listen to this, you know, we, we didn't know him, so we don't know if he was just an average guy who made a couple of stupid decisions and, and just didn't tell the truth or if there was something nefarious there, but it doesn't look like it. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to tell at this point. And to you be, look at how he died. Well, yeah, yeah, to be clear, he yeah, we are referring to him in the past tense. So oh, yeah, because he, unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident. Yeah, yeah which you know, on the wrong side of the road at seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, rushing to work. I mean, that kind of describes him. <laughs> right. You know, that's not good judgment. Yeah. Um, any you know, any probably not a bad guy. Just doesn't show good judgment. Oh, I'm going to push back lightly. He killed another man in the car coming the other way, and he was on the wrong side of the road. So unintentional, though. Oh yeah, no, I, I I'm Bad not judgment. I'm, unintentional. Yeah, that's that's him. But that but that man went to his death because James Robitelli was on the wrong side of the road early in yeah. the morning at a high rate of speed. At a high rate of speed, and well, that crossing the line as he headed over a hill, which and so. We're not talking genius moves, and it cost him his life as well as the other motorist. Right. And it shows poor judgment, and I think that kind of explains his character. Not a yeah, that's, necessarily intentionally bad, but poor judgment. Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. Well, we heard a lot of stories about the overdose. That was a common theme. That was constant. You'd hear, she overdosed, and then people panicked. You know what I mean? Which is why there are laws in effect today that if somebody overdoses and you call for help, they won't blame you for anything. They won't. You can have drugs present. You can. Mm-hmm. They don't care if you're high. They just want to help the person that's, that's harmed. You know, we didn't know if he had just if, if there was somehow a, a, an involvement where he was she had overdosed and had just made a poor judgment call somewhere along the line. There, that was seemed more fitting to what with the information that we had about him rather than him actually intentionally doing something nefarious. I think that his friends would tell you, no, that's just not him kind of deal. You know what I mean? The other thing to keep in mind about this whole, I guess you call it an atmosphere up there is the police presence is minimal at best. Um, you know, they talk about if something happens, you're on your own for about a half an hour. Greg, is that? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Been, it's the strangest thing. I, yeah, it's like, you're on your own. I mean, yeah. you got to do what you got to do because help isn't coming. It's not like yeah. Five and minutes. that's that's really reflective in when you get to know the people. That's something that you come to realize that you don't know. You can't put your finger on it at first, but they know that. That's kind of the way. They, I, I drove one time with a friend. He went with me because I didn't want to go up alone to do an interview. And I drove from the bottom of the state all the way up to the Canadian border. We saw and all the way back and we saw two cops. That's it. Wow. We saw one on the highway, which must have been a trooper as years ago, but then we saw one in Rutland because we kind of came back a real weird way and we're just kind of going the way we were going because we we're just going home. But, oh, geez, we just traversed the state twice. We see two cops. There, there's yeah. no local police presence up in that area in the smaller towns. St. Albans and, and obviously Burlington, South Burlington are different, but you get over into the Montgomery's and the Enosburg and there's just, you know, you're more apt to run into a Border Patrol agent than a... Yeah. Police officer. They mm. don't, I actually not there. Oh, do you remember me telling you that my brother and I went up to Morris crash site one time, Lou, we went up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he was living in Albany at the time. And this was when we were discussing the whole thing of whether Brianna and Morris cases were related. Of course, everyone correlates the two because of the fact that the car was by the side of the road and they're gone. You know, just there were some similarities and they were close geographically and they were close. One happened a month after the other. So we took a ride up there because there was people that would gather every weekend and do searches. So we went up and talked to him, and then we drove up to the crash site and looked around and stuff like that and just kind of got a sense of stuff. But we got pulled or we got stopped by Border Patrol on the way back. And uh, I'm not kidding you. I'm driving my brother's Chrysler 300M or whatever it was, and there was a cop with a dog about 40 feet away. And one of them, they were young guys, one of them walked kind of halfway up to my car and he goes, you got any illegal this, that, and the other thing in the car? And I go, nope. He goes, go ahead. And I drove away and I thought, <laughs> nothing to see here, just two perfectly nice white boys yeah. in a fine car, you know? Ultra, ultra tight security. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, geez, we could have had a, you know, whatever in the trunk and, and it just we couldn't, didn't even bring the dog near the car. But that was kind of reflective of, how porous that whole thing is and the stories we hear from retired troopers up there that it's just crazy you know you're up there you get no radio 
you know, sell for service, no nothing. And again, just the, they're used to it. That's the way they live, you know. So Bruce swears to this day that had they assigned a trooper that was assigned to that area, that case would have been solved because he was a no nonsense. Everybody was afraid of him. He would not hesitate to go and, and get information if he needed it. But they did it. They took an investigator from somewhere else and was not familiar with the area and, and got nowhere with it. Because the locals just like, who are you? You know, they're, they're not going to talk to anybody they don't know up there. And he swears to this day, had they put this other trooper on it, that he would have got to the bottom of it. If it was a local, you know, if it was mm-hmm. someone who was from that area. Speaking of locals, so since Brianna Maitland disappeared in March 2004, there seem to be a ton of questions that surround her circle of friends. So why do you think that her friends may know more about her disappearance? Where are you going, Greg? Greg, Greg is leaving the room. <laughs> Greg Lou, just left the room. Lou, uh, unless Kristen well, and I answer the question, uh, it's all on you. I think the problem is primarily that, and it was kind of interesting to see Lou have to go through this after I did for years, because when he came in, I thanked God, he's coming in because <laughs> I was just, there was too much. It was sensory overload. It was just too much. And I, I, I couldn't do it in work. And it was a, a bothered me. And I was kind of obsessed for a while. I actually took a break for quite a while. But you go interview people, they tell you a story, and you're thinking, oh my God, this is it. They would name names. They would tell you places. They would tell you times. They would go on and on. And none of it would pan out. It would just all be bullshit. And you think, well, you know, you're used to people lying to you occasionally, but this was just not, just seemed nonstop. It's just a real issue with no one up there seemed to be, even about trivial things. Everybody up there seemed to know what happened, but yeah. nobody knew what happened. <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody had a story, but did any of them, had any evidence. Did, okay. any of the, did any of the stories line up or did everybody have a different version? There was similarities. There was the, um, what do you call it, the wood chipper story. There was the pig story. Wow. There was the buried in the farm story. These are um, harsh, 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 harsh. Yeah, and in variations thereof, there was the uh, the barn floor was concreted over. There was, you know, it just goes on and on. This one was involved. No, that one was involved. And this guy tried to kill himself and left a note. And uh, I read the note. Well, did you read the note? No, I didn't see the note. I mean, it just... I believe that story wholeheartedly. But there was, do you remember, the, I got a Robitelli one, was he had told us, he said, he told Lou, uh, was driving down the road the day after Brianna went missing. The girl was walking down the road. I picked her up. She's a friend. I picked her up. I her a ride wherever she was going. Here's the story she told me. And it was a first person account, blah, blah, blah. So I actually went with, along with you to interview her. So she shows up. So now, you know, this is the girl that told us her. She showed up. She was. No, no, you missed this part. She called the police on me first. Remember? Oh, that's right. Because, <laughs> because you're so, the are you're so suspicious looking. Uh, no, nah, she didn't even see me. She just knew I was coming. Yeah, they were. We were meeting in a public at a pizzeria, and so the <laughs> that's right. And then the police called you and asked for your credentials. Yeah. And then she showed up, and she was high. She had literally just smoked a joint before she came in, and. The girl she had with her was 17 and pregnant or something. In a foreign national. <laughs> foreign, and then, I, you know, what can you add to this? It's it's like somebody's making mm-hmm. it up, you know, and she was wearing clown shoes, you know. But she she said, I have no idea what you're talking about. It just never happened. And Greg had his coffee and left. <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, I'm going. I was away. You know, I, I'd been out on the road for a little bit. So I'm like, I'll let you follow up from here because I'm, I'm going to get back on the road. But I, I can just, see it. I get real frustrated. I just want to reach over the table and throttle people. But she's just, she just said, I honestly don't know what you're talking about. And I, I where do you go from there? You know, it, that just happened repeatedly. It's over. And, and over. Yeah, her name pop would pop up every, yeah. every so often. Oh yeah. So-and-so knows it. And, yeah. I mean, it's, it, <sighs> there are so many layers to this thing and, and you try and peel them away and peel them away. And, and, and you wind up with the layers are all gone and there's nothing there. I mean, it's, Enough of the story is true that you keep going at it. Mm-hmm. We had at one point someone who had recorded another person talking about it. Finally tracked this guy down. He said, yeah, I recorded some conversations when I didn't trust my ex. But she never said anything about that. So a little bit of the story is true, but. Yeah, yeah. You know, very, very 
very frustrating, I guess. Um, and I've only been on it for what, two and a half, three years. Greg's been doing it. Half well, his, uh, he had hair when it, when it first started. He, he yeah. had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Drove me nuts. I would drive all the way up there and spend a few days and, you know, talk to people and ask different questions, and then it would just all fall apart, and I would be really just depressed about it. I would get what I thought was very promising information a few times. A few and times. now with COVID, it, it makes it even worse because you, you really can't travel and interview people. Everything's right. got to be done on the internet or on the phone. Mm-hmm. Right. It's frustrating. There's a lot. There's a lot right now that should be being done that isn't being done because of COVID. Yeah. And not all with us. I mean, so. Do you? It seems like um, it seems like there's a through line of um, discussion about drugs, drug use, drug dealing throughout. Can you guys speak to that at all? Like, what have you uncovered in your own investigations about how that may or may not be involved with uh, with her disappearance? Well, it may or may not be involved in her disappearance, but is involved in the Vermont lifestyle okay. up there with those kids. You look at you think about Vermont, and I always think of. I went to college in Vermont, so I was pretty familiar with with the state. You think of covered bridges and cows and maple syrup, uh, <laughs> and in reality, it's heroin and cocaine and kids that have nothing to do except use heroin and wow. cocaine. And it's you know we laugh down here in in Springfield and Holyoke because a couple of times a month they'll arrest a group of people from Vermont. Why? They're in Vermont plates and in the drug invested areas of Springfield or Holyoke driving around. Well, you might as well have a sign. Held up saying, I'm here to buy heroin. Right. Um, I don't know where it's from, you know. Unfortunately, it's reality up there. It's scary because you you don't think of those rural areas as being drug havens. You think of the inner city urban areas. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah, Greg, you know, it's just, we laugh. Oh, we don't laugh. Oh, we we kind of ironically laugh all the time about up there. It's, it's all about sex and drugs. It's know? boredom, I think. Yeah. It's. Yeah being removed kind of isolated a little bit so back in like the late 80s and the 90s remember how bad the biker gangs were in canada it was a really a, a big issue they were like they would bomb bars and stuff like that you can look it up it's pretty interesting but biker gangs took a real interest in vermont just because it was easy to get there and easy to sell drugs there and stuff like that and so a lot of the border was an easy thing to cross back prior to 9-11 right um, you could pretty much just drive across yeah, I can remember asking Bruce, because uh, I went up to the property. It was for sale. I went up with Hank Elberelli, and uh, I called him, and I said, how far is the border from here? He said, where are you, and this is where are you face? And he said, all right, turn to your left and walk about 400 yards. I said, really? Yep. I said, is there a fence? He goes, no. Yeah. He goes, it's... every once in a while, you'll see a little bit of an old rickety fence or something. He goes, but that's it. I go, because I, I never lived near the border. You know, I'm like, so what? You could just walk across the border? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I'd be out there cutting wood. He goes, I'd see guys come walking by through the woods, wave to me, They're carrying a backpack. So if guys can carry, you know, 10 or 12 pounds of weed or whatever on their back, what makes you think they couldn't carry a dirty bomb or something in there? But, you know, it wasn't an uncommon thing. And um, I remember Hank went to a meeting one time, some kind of, he lived in Richford for a while. He was from Burlington. He went to a meeting and he asked a question of the, the whoever the police official that was there talking. And he said, can you tell me about how many, you know, what the, what the amount of drugs is that's coming over the border here in this area? He said, as much as they can carry, as often as they can carry it. And I was like, okay. So he just, had called me the next morning and was telling me about this. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's a boredom thing up there. Mm-hmm. So everyone, that's the problem too. So Lou and I got discussing these statistics one time. So there's, and I have it printed up here. I should have got it out because Bill and I had talked about it briefly. But there's statistics for when a child goes missing that are really, you can be confident in them because of the, the statistics are 80 or 90% of the time a child is abducted. At, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but within a quarter mile of their home. But they go by ages. And so they know it's not like it's a 50-50 or a 60-40. It's pretty confident when they how often they get killed, how far they are from the point of where they get killed to where they're found. It's really pretty site specific, but the problem is with Brianna's case is that she was a certain age, but she was living as an adult. Right. Mm-hmm. So right. The statistics kind of go out the window. Mm-hmm. You know, she's functioning as a you know as, as Bruce likes to say, she was seventeen going on twenty five. She, yeah. she was confident but, but naive at the same time. So that kind of throws a wrench in, in trying to think of it that, in that way. Yeah, and she, she was also a very high risk lifestyle. Exactly. That's what I think I was trying to get at. Yeah. And she was. Their acquaintance. Why don't you 
I don't know whether Bill and, and Kristen are familiar or not with who Hank Alborelli is. You've mentioned him a number of times. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Hank. So Hank was uh, an investigative journalist who lived in Burlington, and then he moved to Richford, which is right there in that area of Montgomery. So he wrote two of probably the best articles written on Mora in, in Brianna at the time. Mora got a lot of, for whatever reason, got a lot of publicity, but Brianna kind of didn't. Right. So. But so when he covered them, because there was a thought that they may be related, he, he included them together. It was really interesting. And he did a lot of really great, he came up with some really great stuff. He was a little conspiratorial. I, I got to say that, but he did come up with some great stuff. Unfortunately, he passed away. He had considered a bunch of times writing a book about it. And, and I always tried to prompt him to come back in and do stuff because as much as he would come up with stuff that was, that I didn't agree with, he always came up with something really good. It's kind of like, it was kind of like uh, James Renner with Mora. Mm. You know, he kind of hated, <laughs> hated his opinion and some of the stuff he says and stuff like that. But at the same time, he really did come up with a lot of good information that was useful, very useful. He had some good sources, Hank. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna try he, to link. His, we're gonna try to link to some of of Hank Alberelli's stories in the show notes of this episode because you guys have recommended him. And we've heard great things about his writing. I'm so sorry that he's passed because, as you said, it sounds like he did some really outstanding work. And you and, and you might not have agreed with everything, but there was good stuff in there. Yeah, it was unfortunate that um, he he put out these articles, and when you find them on the internet now, they're cut up. There's pieces missing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got the hard copies, the old hard copies. I've- it up so i know when i read it i can compare it to say oh they left something out or they edited it or something he actually had i don't know if it's still up but he had a website where you could buy his books and stuff like that and his daughter's a i don't see some kind of screenwriter or something in the uk hmm. travel back and forth from florida to the uk different different guy he but he knew he because he grew up there and because he spent so much time there and stuff he'd go talk to these kids the kids loved them and i say kids they were young adults but they loved them and they, they trusted them and he did good by him, and he took people right in there, right to the barracks. And they want to talk to you, and, and you know the police would take him in and talk to him. So that was that was good. Join us next time for more information on the Brianna Maitland case when we'll be talking to Lewis Berry and Greg Overacker from Private Investigations for the Missing. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. Join us again soon. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mm